Um, yeah, it's an honor and a privilege to be with you this morning, and thank you, uh, Pastor Aaron and Pastor Ivan, for inviting me to, to speak. And um, So I've had a year and a half of building up ideas. How much time do you have today? <laughs> um, tw- 20 minutes. <laughs> <laughs> okay. <laughs> I was thinking maybe if you ordered lunch by your app, you might want to change your time code. But anyway, um, I, uh, I have a you know, whole breadth of things that I could speak on, but I thought of like, what, what will we start 2023 with? Uh, because we all do this thing, or most of us do this thing at the beginning of the year where we... Uh, sort of re-examine life, re-examine the year past, what's ahead in the year 2023. And there's sort of this renewing of ideas and thoughts and so on going forward. Um, and, and so there, there are a number of things that we could address about new beginnings, but I, this uh, thought came into my head about a week and a half ago um, after pa- Pastor Aaron asked if I would speak about the concept of prosperity. Would we prosper in 2023? So that was the question that I started with. And of course, there's a whole bunch of teaching in the scriptures on prosperity, uh, but I thought I'd key in on one that's commonly misused, uh, and that's 3 John chapter 2 uh, with regard to prosperity because it's often used as leverage for financial prosperity and a connection between our behavior and what God does with us financially. So I thought it'd be a good, uh, good verse to tackle and a good way to start the new year in terms of raising hope that we would have a prosperous year in 2023. So 3 John uh, verse 2, uh, there's only one chapter, so you can't say chapter, you could say chapter 1, I guess, there's only one. Uh, 3 John verse 2 says, Beloved, I pray that in all respects you may prosper and be in good health, just as your soul prospers. Beloved, I pray that in all respects you may prosper and be in good health, just as your soul prospers. That's a New American Standard Bible. Uh, There are other versions that use the word well-being instead of prosper, which is uh, the concept that's contained there. There's this whole life well-being concept. Um, and so I don't know if you uh, do news feeds. I'm terrible. You know, sometimes I get to the news feed before my devotions, and my devotions get delayed a half an hour. That should not be, I know, but sometimes it just pulls me in. And uh, one of the first headlines that came up on my news feed uh, in uh, this week was um, this. The, the title of it was, By 9.43 a.m., Canada's richest CEOs have already earned the average annual worker's salary. So the article means that by, so, you know, January 3rd was the first business day of 2023, right? Right. So by the first business day of 2023 at 9.43 a.m. in the morning, the highest paid CEOs in Canada had already made at or in excess of $58,800. How would you like to have opened your bank account on January the 3rd at 9.43 and see a check in there for $58,800? That'd be a pretty good way to start off 2023, wouldn't it? I don't know where your income's at, but that'll look pretty good in my account. (laughs) Um, Now, there's this thing. Gaius, uh, who is the guy that John is writing to, um, we don't know a lot about him, but we do know that he's probably in pretty good state in terms of his relationship with the Lord. Uh, First of all, John calls him beloved. So he's a dear brother in the Lord. He's well known to John. Uh, John knows the quality of his life because he says that I I pray that you prosper and be in good health even as your soul is prospering. So there's obviously a prosperity of his soul that's going on that John is recognizing. 
And so we right away get the idea that prosperity may not be exclusively in the domain of money, that it may uh, project beyond and encompass more than just money. So, um, so Gaius uh, is, is uh, under this banner of John's blessing, prayer blessing, of receiving prosperity in the, all the domains of his life and in his health, even as his soul is prospering. So then let me ask you, if I had prayed for you on January the 3rd, Father, I pray that my sister or my brother would prosper and be in good health even as their soul is prospering. Do you think there might have been $58,800 or more put in your bank account? Do you get the connection I'm making here? There are all of these other dimensions of prosperity. John is praying, prosper these things in accord with the prosperity of their soul. So what's the state of your soul? What kind of a response would that get in these other areas if God, say financially, if God were to bless you financially, even as your soul is going right now? Would your bank account go down? <laughs> would it stay the same? Or would it go up? Well, Janice and I finished 2022 uh, by giving away a fair bit of money. So we tithe uh, monthly, and so I put my tithe in. And there's some other needs that came up, and we wound up giving away in excess of $2,000 um, just before, before and at the turn of the year to some people that were in dire need. So my bank account's kind of going this way. I haven't seen $58,800 show up yet. <laughs> I'm hoping, <laughs> but not yet. It's uh, so far in 2023, it's going the wrong way. Um, so what do you think if somebody prayed that prayer over me? Uh, you know, prosper him even as his soul is prospering. Would I be prospering in 2023 with a bank account that's going like that? Will you prosper in 2023? In November, um, I was doing some studies for uh, this uh, program I'm involved in, and, uh, and I was particularly focused on the fatherhood of God, which is probably my great theme, right, Warren? <laughs> it's kind of been a life theme for me. And there's this uh, verse right at the close of the Old Testament in Malachi that says, uh, essentially, I'll send Elijah before you, the prophet, to turn the hearts of the fathers back to the sons and the hearts of the sons back to the fathers, lest I come and smite the land with a curse. And I was particularly interested in, what does God mean by that? I will smite the land with a curse. Right? That seems to be like the opposite of prosperity. So what is the connection between the hearts of the fathers turning to the sons, hearts of the sons turning to the fathers, and God's blessing versus his cursing on the land? And I was curious about that enough that I thought, you know, it's probably not good just to focus on that one verse. I'm going to do a book study of Malachi. So I did. I did a whole book study of Malachi. Um, I did it inductively first by reading it myself several times, and then I uh, did a, a quick outline of the structure of the book of Malachi. Then I went into some commentaries and I started doing some research. And I spent several days just looking into the book of Malachi. And of course, I came across the famous verse in 310, right? You know that one? Bring the whole tithe into the storehouse so that there may be food in my house. And test me now in this, says the Lord of hosts, if I will not open up for you the windows of heaven and pour out for you a blessing until it overflows. Now, preachers love that passage. <laughs> That's when the, the one where they hook you and say, you need, you need to tithe and bring the tithe into the storehouse. Um, and I had used that uh, passage and taught on that passage several times in my lifetime, but I'd never really looked at the context of Malachi to understand what that verse means for Malachi and for the people that he's speaking to in their situation. 
So I started studying this whole thing of the land and prosperity, what it means when God blesses the land, what it means when God curses the land. And you don't study the Old Testament very long before you come up with this repetitive cycle that happens all the time. And it goes like this. God steps forward and says, I want you to be my people and I will be your God. So let's enter a covenant. And here's my covenant. All you have to do is love me with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength and obey my commandments. That's all I ask. And here's what I'll do for you. I will pour out this blessing and I will pour out that blessing. Your cattle will prosper. Your sheep will prosper. Your, your women will have lots of babies and families will grow. And I'll keep all the enemies from roundabout from from, from coming and assaulting you and taking away your stuff. I'll protect you in every way that you could imagine and I'll prosper you in every way you could imagine if you just keep covenant with me. And everybody says, that sounds like a good deal. Let's do that. Okay, <laughs> I'm in. <laughs> Thank you, Lord. And, you know, they, they do. They make covenant with God and they start off worshiping him and they're bringing the sacrifice in the temple. They're doing their tithe thing and they're obeying his commandments and everything starts to go good. You know, God comes good on his word and he starts to prosper them. And sure enough, their cattle multiply and their sheep multiply and the rain comes in season and the crops multiply and uh, lots of babies and families are growing and none of the enemies round about have a way with them and every w battle that they get into with them, the Israel defeats them and everything's really good. And then at some point in that little process there, they start to go, well, you know, things are going pretty good here. I'm not sure I have to give my whole tithe. <laughs> you know, there's this uh, BMW that I want. And uh, it's going to cost a little more than the car that I could buy. So I think I'll skim on my tithe. And by the way, I wouldn't buy a BMW anymore. There, eh, never mind. <laughs> That's a rabbit trail. Uh, <clears throat> uh, so yeah, they've, they've got subscriptions now to get your seats heated. But anyway, um, so, so they start to do this, right? And they, they think, hey, if I just adjust the weights on this scale here just a little bit, then I can get a couple more shekels on every transaction. And nobody will know that this scale isn't right. I'll just get a little more on each transaction. And then they start to say, somebody gets into poverty because uh, something calamity happens and then they get sold into slavery and somebody comes along, their brother, a fellow Israelite comes along and says, hey, I'll buy your property up from you. And they're supposed to give that back in the Jubilee but they, they don't give it back in the Jubilee. And, and so they maintain slavery within their own household. And then they start to say, you know, Israelite women are okay, but those Moabite women, <laughs> oh man, I think I'd like one of those. Thank you very much. Because they get to do things worshiping their God that we don't get to do worshiping our God. And I kind of like to try some of that out. And it doesn't take long before there's this slide that starts to happen. And people get disfellowship from God. And then, as God promised, once they start to disfellowship from God, once their worship life starts to lax and they start to get into all of this dirty dealing, then the hand of God starts to be removed. And pretty soon, you've got an enemy coming from the outside with their warriors, and some of the cities on the perimeter get overthrown, and the wives and the cattle and the crops and everything are taken away, and the men are all killed, and there starts to be this incursion. Then all of a sudden, there's a drought period. The rain doesn't come. The crops don't produce. Then the, the cattle start uh, you know, uh, still birthing, and then the sheep are producing lame ducks. Oh, I was lame ducks, another sheep. Um, <laughs> well, you get the idea. Uh, things just start to go wrong, and it, it, it's encroaching, and it gets worse and worse and worse until their backs get against the wall, and then they say, oh God, help. <laughs> uh, you know, you promised this stuff, and God says, yeah, and you're doing this stuff, and you're breaking my covenant, and you're breaking my laws, and that's why this is happening to you. And they say, we repent. Like, let's renew the covenant. And so God says, okay, I'll have mercy on you. Let's renew the covenant. So they renew the covenant and they repent. And guess what? Things start to go well again. And this cycle continues repetitively through the Old Testament. Um, and, and that's exactly what is happening with, with the situation with Malachi. Only worse. 
because there came an end to this whole thing where God finally said, first to the northern kingdom uh, in, in 722 BC, but then to the southern kingdom of Judah, he finally said, enough, I've, I've had it. And you know, Josiah was the last great king and he did all of these reforms and everything was supposed to go well again, but the people's hearts didn't buy into it. They were still sinning, they were still disobeying God. And God said, enough. And so he allowed the Babylonians to come and you know, destroy Jerusalem and destroy the temple and take away all the nobles and take away all the treasures and everything went to Babylon. And they were exiled in Babylon for several decades and so it was a mess. They, they didn't have their homeland. They didn't have their God. They didn't have their temple. They didn't have their sacrificial system. Like, there was a mess. And finally, the, the Medes and the Persians overthrew the Babylonians, and the king said, hey, let's restore Israel. Send them back home and give them some money and give them free passage and, you know, send out a decree that they'll be protected. So away they go back to Jerusalem, and the, the thought is we're going to reestablish everything. We're going to start this covenant with God over. We're going to rebuild the walls of Jerusalem, rebuild the temple, and restore all the artifacts and restart all the sacrifices. Let's get our act back together. And so under um, Ezra and Nehemiah and a couple of prophets, they did this, attempted this restoration thing, but they ran into all kinds of problems in the process. Uh, there were enemies round about that kept sending false messages back to, back to Babylon. And, and so there was a whole bunch of political stuff going on, on and they had to try and build the wall while they're holding a sword in one hand and putting stones in with the other. It was just really difficult. And a lot of the people just said, enough. Like, I, I don't need this. We don't need the temple again. We don't need this stuff. And, and so they're, they're making very poor salaries and and the crops weren't producing well, and the cattle weren't producing well, and the sheep weren't producing well, and so they just gave bad sacrifices. You know, they, they, <laughs> they brought in the grain that was already uh, sitting in the, in the granary for, for a year, and they brought the cattle that, uh, you know, were missing a leg, and they, they brought the sheep that were missing two years, if you can picture that. I'm just kidding. Uh, but they brought, they didn't bring good sacrifices, and that's why... Malachi does this thing about bring, bring the tithe in. Would you stop bringing the Lord these lousy, dilapidated, second-rate sacrifices? You're, you're, you're just bringing wrath down on yourself. Bring the right tithe into the storehouse. Bring your first fruits. Bring your best cattle. Bring your best sheep. And, and he's really on it. And he says, and, and the Lord hates divorce because they were divorcing Israelite wives and marrying uh, wives with these foreign gods and bringing foreign idolatry in. And he says, stop that. Stop that. Get rid of those foreign wives and their idolatrous practices. Come and worship the Lord. And so Malachi is kind of really on this thing because everything is just limping along. It's just not good. And perhaps the highest evidence of that is that the hearts of the fathers or fathers and mothers are turned against their children. And the hearts of the children, the sons, are turned against the fathers. There's this family breakdown that's happening as sort of the quintessential evidence that things are not well in Israel's life. They're not worshiping. And so the Lord says, I'm going to send Elijah before you to restore these family relationships because if that doesn't happen, I'm going to smite the land with a curse. Like you won't be able to feed your cattle. You won't be able to feed your sheep. You won't, you won't be pulling in grain to make bread. You're going to have nothing if you don't stop this. So, so, there's this question, will you bring the tithe into the storehouse? Well, what does that mean, actually? And what was the big deal about the tithe? Well, if you do research, the tithe does not begin in the law. In other words, it's not, a, it's not primarily a legal duty to bring the tithe into the storehouse. The tithe began with Abraham in Genesis 14, when he tithed a, a tenth of the spoils from a campaign that he had to this strange figure, the priest of Salem called Melchizedek. He's this strange guy, he pops up in the Old Testament. And then, then we see him again big time in Hebrews, where it says that Jesus is an eternal priest after the order of Melchizedek. 
So there's this connection between Abraham tithing to Melchizedek and Abraham's daughters and sons by faith tithing to Jesus. Why is that? Well, because in the first case, tithe was always an act of worship. It was not an act of law. It was an act of worship. And so it began in worship, and it becomes the centerpiece of what Israel is doing wrong. It's a reflection that they are not worshiping God properly when they're not bringing their tithe into the storehouse. And so under the new covenant, you might run an easy parallel saying, I understand that there's this principle of generosity that supersedes the tithe in the New Testament, but at the least case, we would say, we got to deal with our money in a way that worships Jesus. He's an eternal priest after the order of Melchizedek. So I say that to say that when Malachi's talking about bringing the whole tithe into the storehouse, God's saying, in effect, if you will worship me properly, I'll open the floodgates of heaven. Right? He's not saying if you give me money, I'll open the floodgates. The essence of what he's saying is if you worship me, I will prosper you. And what does that mean? Well, it doesn't mean, as we learn from 3 John, only that you're going to get extra money or some kind of financial provision. There are all these other dimensions of life. Your family. What's the state of your family? I mean, how many families are in distress? How many families, your sons and your daughters, aren't following the Lord? How many families where there's there's hatred between brother and brother, sister and sister, and brother-in-law and sister-in-law? How many families are distressed? This is one of the key ways that God brings blessing is through healing family relationships. I mean, there are all kinds of dynamics involved in prosperity, but the centerpiece of what Malachi is saying is that you've got to get back to worshiping God properly if you want to see his manifold blessing prosper your life. So I come back to this question, do you want to prosper in 2023? you got a year ahead of you. We're only in the, at the very beginning of the year, and there's a whole year ahead of you. And the question is begged, do you want to prosper in 2023? And you can. You can. You can prosper in 2023, if you begin with worship. If you begin first with coming before the Lord and attending to what's in here first. If you come before the Lord and you renew covenant with the Lord, you say, I, I forgive me for being wayward. Forgive me for the places I went and the things that I did that were out of your will in 2022. I want to renew my covenant with you in 2023. And I want to establish good practices. I want to spend time worshiping. I mean, you know, I'm so thankful for the ministry of worship in church, but our our life of worship is not about singing three songs on Sunday morning. How many of you get in a secret place with the Lord with your two or three favorite worship songs three or four times a week and just alone in your secret place Worship the Lord and give yourself to him. You know, it's the same thing with the Bible. We read a few passages here on Sunday morning. Some of you are on those reading programs, you know, where you're reading like seven chapters a day through the whole year so you can get through the Bible in one year. That's not going to be super helpful, I'll tell you. How many of you are actually getting into the Word of God in an interactive, relational way such that new revelation is coming to you? You can say, On a regular basis, God is opening up my heart and my mind to new dimensions of his word that I never understood before. I'm praying, I'm going to the Bible prayerfully and with a pen and pencil or a notebook in hand to really interact with the Bible so that it becomes a meaningful part of revelation that God's opening up new things, new vistas, new avenues, new hope, new insights, new wisdom on a regular basis. I won't say it'd be daily, but is it regular in your life that you're getting new revelation from God? And how about your groups? I love this, all the groups up there. Um, I was a group guy, right, Warren? (laughs) I love groups. I've always loved groups. I was sharing with Warren this week about, um, you know, some uh, group that I ran for a couple years with a few guys, and 
the, the meaningful time that we had together in our final night together before we dissolved for the summer and how uh, we worshiped and, and prayed together and t shared testimonies together and so on. But does your fellowship, first of all, do you have fellowship with other believers or are you isolated? Are you in a group of some kind with two or three brothers, two or three sisters, or an organized group in the church? Uh, and, and are the groups that you're in, do they have real fellowship? Having pizza and watching the world juniors with Christians is not Christian fellowship. <laughs> I hate to disappoint you. <laughs> are your groups meaningful in terms of really getting into each other's lives, opening up your hearts, sharing your struggles, sharing the testimonies of what God's doing that's great in your life by encouragement? Are you using spiritual gifts to interact with each other? Are you prophesying over one another? Are you bringing words of knowledge, words of wisdom? Are you praying for healing for each other and seeing God move in miraculous power to heal physical bodies and emotional issues? Are your groups vital in Christian fellowship? These are the things that actually are means of grace by which God infuses prosperity to our soul. So I, I'm, how am I, I doing for time? I, I, just a little bit of a little, little rabbit trail. <laughs> There's this thing, um, because it ties in, and I, I, did, I, won't, I won't go out do it very, very briefly, but there's this thing over in 2 Corinthians chapter 3 um, that basically says, as we behold the face of God, we're transformed into his likeness. And by the way, that's pretty much true of everything. Whatever you behold, you become like. Whatever you fix your gaze on for any length of time, you start to become like it. I love blue bloods. Uh, so I set a recording to record episodes of Blue Bloods. And when I, when I set that recording, it was only on one station once a week. I don't know what happened over the holidays, but it's on every station every day. I've got like 200 episodes. And I don't know what your nature's like, but I'm like, I've got to get through those episodes and get that countdown. I've got to keep up with the number of recordings. So I, you know, I'm watching two or three episodes of Blue Bloods a day and skipping all the commercials. Yeah! And... Uh, you know, too much of blue blood is not a good thing. Even though it's one of the better programs on TV, it's still not good if my gaze is constantly fixed on those characters and their attitudes and the way they operate life and so on and so forth. What you fix your gaze on, you become like. And so the Lord says, as you, in 2 Corinthians 3, when you fix your gaze on the Lord, you become like him. It says you're transformed from one degree of glory to another into the likeness of Jesus. So there's this ever-increasing glory in your life. Your soul just explodes in the glory of God from one degree to another degree to another degree as your gaze is fixed on him. Then you turn over the chapter and it says this slight and momentary affliction is achieving for us an eternal weight of glory. Now without going into great detail, what that means is your soul has a substance to it that can handle glory. Glory has a weight. I don't know if you know that. But when the glory of God comes on, I was prayed for by Mahesh Chavda, if you know who that was. And, he, and this was his, I waited in line for an hour with 1,200 people to get prayed for him. <clears throat> and this was his prayer. He put his hand on my forehead and he said, the glory. Yes. And I went, okay, I waited an hour for that. <laughs> Thank you very much. And so then the escort starts to walk me away. And I went, one, two, <laughs> down to the floor. I dropped and I couldn't move. I, I was on the floor, and I literally could not move. And I tried. Like, I, I, I pushed myself up with all, my, all the strength in me to, to get my elbow up, off, get my body up off the floor. I couldn't move. And I said to the Lord, like, what is this? And he said, that's my glory. I said, oh, that's what he prayed for me. <laughs> glory has a weight in all of its dynamics. So... I just use this example. If you prayed for 50 people and 10 of them got healed, you would see very quickly that some people would start to seek you out to pray for them to get healing. 
immediately pressure would start to come on you because you exercise this level of glory, weight would come on you. And if you got to the point where you're healing, say 70% of all the people that you pray for, there'd be people from all the community and the surrounding area starting to come to church to seek you out to get you to pray for them with the expectation that if you pray for them, you're going to get them healed. Now you know that that healing does not depend on you. But there's a an expectation that you're going to get people healed. See, there's a weight of glory that comes with the level of gift that you're exercising. And so that's what it means. The slight and momentary afflictions and beholding the face of God and being in his presence increases glory. It means it increases your soul's capacity to handle the weight of what God wants to put into your life by way of other dimensions of prosperity, whether it's finances or relationships or gifting or ministry or whatever it is, your soul has a capacity to handle it and he wants to increase the capacity. He wants to increase the prosperity of your soul so that all of these other dimensions, you can handle them without blowing up. So I'm going to close by just giving you an example from my life. It's not a fun example, but it's a real example. <clears throat> so back in uh, 1989, uh, we had a terrible first charge in ministry. Thank you for praying for us, Warren. <laughs> Our first year in ministry was really miserable. It was challenging, difficult. We had some very difficult people in the church, some very mean-spirited people. Anyway, I was not going to continue in ministry after one year. I'd spent... Uh, six years doing a bachelor and master's degree and I was done after one year and I kind of got rescued by a, an elder in the church and he found a good church for me to go to so I went to this church in 89 and, and I said to Janice because our life was in such a term and we were just starting a family I said to Janice I promise you be careful about what what you promise um, I, I promise you we will be there for a minimum of three years so that I won't disrupt and interrupt the development of our family by moving us around every place. If it doesn't work out, I'm not going somewhere else. Three years minimum. So we went there, and I didn't know this was coming, but I had a major encounter with the Holy Spirit in Edmonton uh, that year and uh, changed the whole dynamics of how I understood worship and uh, the miraculous ministry of the Holy Spirit, and I started uh, doing some things and seeing some miracles, and I wound up in conflict with the senior pastor. And two years in, it was really pretty, pretty tough going, and I was looking for a way out. <laughs> I just didn't want to have to deal with all this pounding all the time and all this challenge the way God was leading me, and this opportunity came up to plant a church back in Kingston, which is where we got beat up. Going back into the lion's den, right? Glutton for punishment. And I said, hey, there's the opportunity I need. And I started spinning this thing in my head, like, this is God's call. He wants me to plant a church. He's given me this endowment of the Holy Spirit. He wants me to do a new thing with new worship music, do a ministry in a new way, focusing on the gifts and the power of the Holy Spirit. And I can see God set this up. Except for one thing, I promised Janice that I would stay there three years. And we're two years in, and I'm getting ready to pull the plug. Now, I don't know how your mind works, but this is the way my mind works. I have a, I'm very adept at rationalizing and putting it under the banner of God's will to do what I feel like I want to do, even when my commitment over here says I should not do that. I just spin it. I line up the evidence. Well, God gave me this encounter. God gave me these gifts. God gave me this vision for worship. It's a church plant. It's a clean slate. I can develop it however I want, and I'm going to go and do it. And this little thing over here is going, yeah, but yeah, we'll work that out. And so I pulled the plug. We left. We went to Kingston. 
Janice left grieving because the church uh, we were there for her was, it was an incredibly good church. It was so loving, so supportive, helped her with children and so on and so forth. The problem is, when we went there, we bought our first house. Does anybody remember the days when mortgages were at 18 and three quarters percent? <laughs> I know, I'm aging myself here. Everybody thinks they got it bad at 5%. <laughs> we bought that house at 18 and three quarters percent. We got a real bargain when we bought going back to Kingston at 11 and a quarter percent. The rates had dropped. And we thought that was gold that we only had to pay 11 and a quarter percent on our new mortgage. The problem is we now had two mortgages. So my ability to pay that mortgage depends on selling that house, right? And guess what? The house wasn't selling. It got caught in that uh, late 80s, early 90s tailspin uh, in the perimeter of Toronto, and the market was just going down and down. We kept lowering the price, and it, it wouldn't sell, it wouldn't sell, and it got so bad, I knew we were going to run out of money. We put a renter in the house temporarily to try it try and offset some of the mortgage. We we're still bleeding at $400 a month. The guy turned out to be a drug addict. After three months, he stopped paying his rent. Then we had to try and get them out of the house. It was just nightmarish. We were watching all of our equity just, just being burned away. We were watching our savings account being burned away. We were having nightmares with this tenant. It, it was just incredibly difficult. And I was trying to plant a church and those of you at OVC know exactly what planting a church is like, setting up equipment, tearing it down a week after week after week. It's just hard slugging. Thank God for this church. <laughs> you know, I know the relief involved in getting a building. It's, it's a huge factor in uh, planting a church. And so I, w I was really distressed. This went on for three years. We couldn't sell this house. And when we finally sold it, we had no equity. We had put $55,000 into that house, all of our savings to that point in our life. We had paid down the mortgage a few thousand through our payments. All of it was gone. Our savings account was gone. In fact, this is, this is right on the, the point of the truth. I could not have paid one more mortgage payment. If that house had not sold, I would have been going probably to my in-laws and saying, help, <laughs> I was in trouble. We were in trouble. And when it sold, I was broken. I didn't understand. I had convinced myself that I was serving the Lord and I was following his will and I was planning a church and I was engaging real worship and we were seeing people saved regularly. We saw people come into the kingdom and all of this stuff. And I had this all in my mind that I was, I was doing everything right and God was like cursing my finances, and I, I was just frustrated and, and so disappointed with God. And, um, and then the, the church plant broke up. In, in the year after we sold the house, the church plant, there was a group of people that started a thing, you know, and they gained a following, and they didn't like me for something that I did, and half the church left one Sunday. They just didn't show up. And I was busted. I mean, I was disillusioned with ministry. I got out of ministry. I went into bereavement support. <laughs> I thought researching grief was a good thing at that point. Um, and, uh, and so I, I was frustrated with God. And I don't know, it was some time after I was praying, and I said to the Lord, like, what did I do wrong? Do you know that's one of the most dangerous prayers you can pray? That is one of those prayers that God almost always answers. What's wrong with me? What did I do wrong? And the, and the Lord was like a heartbeat said, you broke a vow to your wife. And I said, what? I kind of went, what? <laughs> you know, all of this because I broke a vow to my wife? And he said, you broke a vow. To your wife and I said wow and I started listening to what the Lord had to say and he uncorked that whole thing for me 
and showed how all of this calamity and distress came because I broke a vow to my wife. And I said, well, how do I fix it? And he, you know, stirred up my heart to go and ask Janice for forgiveness for what I had done, uh, recognizing the hurt and the pain that it caused her, the, the, just the post-traumatic stress of going back to, to Kingston two years after we had been beat up so badly at that first church, and then the stress of planning a church, trying to start a young family, and, you know, like I all but abandoned her because of this church plant, and I was, you know, I was ministering in significant power, and people were calling me to pray for them, like I told you, and I was getting all these guest speaking appointments. Like, I, I was not a good husband and a good father through that period, not an attentive one, that's for sure, and God revealed and uncorked that whole thing for me, and I went back, and I asked her for forgiveness. Nine years after we uh, left Bowmanville to go back to Kingston, I wound up in Canada, which is where I met Warren and Leanne. And, uh, and I met this guy named Peter, and Peter to this day has been a lifelong friend. And I remember I was in Peter's office one day, so this is nine years later, years 2000, I'm in Peter's office, and I'm sharing with him all that transpired. I'm pouring out my complaint <laughs> before Peter, and I'm grieving all of the stuff that we went through. And, and he looks at me in one of those moments that only God can orchestrate and says, isn't God's sense of money and time interesting? And I said, what do you mean? He said, well, imagine that God would spend nine years of your life and $55,000 of your money to teach you one lesson. <laughs> it was one of those moments where I kind of went, like, wow, would God really do that? He would. Why? Because prosperity of the soul is his first priority every time with us. Every time. He's going after your heart. He's going after your soul. He wants to have a love relationship with you that's so deep and so abiding, that's so communal in terms of interchange of worship and speaking and loving and giving, but it's all built on the state of our soul. How much he can release to us has everything to do with what the state of our soul is. And God knew. I'm telling you, God knew. When John prayed this prayer, in all respects that you may prosper in good health as your soul prospers, God knew that if he had prospered me any more in any way, with more gifting or more anointing or more people coming to Christ or more growth in my church or more money or more influence or if he had prospered me any more in that state of my soul, it would have killed me. He knew that. And so he took it all away. He took away the money. He took away the ministry. He took away the gifting. He took it all away for nine years. It just went this way so he could get my soul. If God had given me, well, let me, let me just uh, turn this and I'll, I'll close with this. One year later, um, through a series of what I would only call miraculous financial dealings, uh, God uh, put a quarter of a million dollars in our pocket in equity and money. It was just one year after we moved, two years, a year and a half after we moved to Canada. In other words, he not only restored the $55,000, but added $200,000 to it. And it was his orchestration. I could tell you the story sometime, how God just used people and used circumstances. And anyway, it was a real major turnaround in our whole financial well-being. So I don't think God is out to empty your bank account. Unless he has to do it to get your soul. And once he gets your soul, then he can prosper you in whatever ways you need to prosper to maintain the integrity of your soul. 
And in the process, your soul can now handle more. I apparently couldn't stand $55,000 with the substance of my soul in 91. But in 2001, apparently I could handle $250,000 with the substance of my soul. You see, the prosperity of the soul is absolute priority with God. Will you prosper in 2023? I'll tell you, if you want to, you can. And I'm going to ask you to stand, if you want to. This is all voluntary. There's no coercion here. But in a moment, um, the worship team is going to come back up. The worship team, all both of you, (laughs) is going to come up. And I'm I'm just going to, before they sing this song, I wanted to do this song as a response and a declaration. Um... And so I asked Pastor Aaron if we could have a strong praise song to close the service with as a point of declaration. Now, you don't have to stand, but before we sing that song, what I would like to do is if you declare, you want to declare at the outset here of 2023 that you want this to be a year of the prospering of your soul, that you want to stand today and say, God, I'm all in. I'm covenanting. I'm re-covenanting with you. I'm going to come back to my first love I am going to seek you in worship. I'm going to seek you in prayer. I'm going to seek you by getting into fellowship with brothers and sisters so my faith can grow. I'm going to seek you uh, by doing all that you tell me to do in obedience to the leading of your Holy Spirit. Um, If this is a covenant statement that you're making with God, then I want to pray John's prayer over you that all of the other dimensions of your life would prosper and your health even as your soul is prospering. So that as you covenant with the Lord and really go after prospering your soul this year, you will see a wave of blessing come in behind that that affirms God's love for you, that affirms that he's with you in this going after him for the prosperity of your soul. Okay, so it's all voluntary, but if you want to stand, I will pray that over you, and then we'll use this final song as a declaration, okay?